Well, thank you. Thank you for having us. Um, we thought we'd actually start with a couple questions for you guys, and then we'll get into our wrap a little bit. Uh, just with a show of hands, we're curious, how many people here might consider themselves meditators? Okay. How about how many people have tried it, but thought it, quote unquote, just didn't work, or they weren't good at it? Okay. And, and it's all right to be honest, how many people are skeptical that it works, haven't tried it? And, all right, so not a lot of skeptics on here. We, we, no, they all they all read and shit. These are smart people. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, like the research is crystal clear. <laughs> right, so it does work. Obviously, it does work. Yeah, I mean, well, that's what the neuroscientists are saying, right? Everybody's saying that, and they say the greatest gateway to happiness, right? Meditation. You hear it, and you hear it enough, you kind of believe it. But if you have faith in something, you do it, right? You have total faith, absolute faith. You do it. If it makes you happy, you do it. Meditation makes you happy. That's what they say. It's what the research says. Meditation gives you greater brain functionality. You people work at Google. You're all brain, brainiacs, right? <laughs> greater brain functionality, greater memory, calm nervous system, get rid of your ADD, lower your blood pressure, all that stuff, you know all that, because you're sitting here, you probably studied it quick, like a quick study that you are. So you already know what meditation is for and, and what they say it does, and you kind of believe it because it's, the proof is everywhere now. Well, let's, let's rewind it for one second, because when we asked if some people had tried it and thought it didn't work, a but lot of people... But the skeptics, no one would say they No one's a skeptic, skeptic, all right. But the people who said they tried it and it, quote, didn't work... We're going to teach them, that's easy. But let's address that. Is it possible to do meditation wrong, or is everyone doing it right? Well, yeah, if you, it's wrong if you don't... The one thing you, everyone has to have in order to be a meditator is patience. Okay. You have to have a bit of patience. You know, my name is Rush, so I can meditate. And my, my kids, they didn't want to meditate. Mother said, sit your fucking... <laughs> they became meditators. They said, don't move, you know, and, and you sit there and the mind's crazy like a monkey. It bounces around in the head. It's like, go to the refrigerator. Get, get something to eat. Hit her before she breaks out. She's going to leave. Get her this morning. <laughs> you know, all kinds of stuff. And you're sitting there and your mind's telling you, stop, stop. And you're saying, I can't stop until the alarm goes off. I can't. The alarm goes off. So you can scratch. Do whatever you want, but can't go nowhere. So the mind is bouncing around like a monkey in a cage, and then it settles. And you say to yourself, oh shit, I'm meditating. <laughs> and then it bounces around some more, and then it transcends the thoughts even more. And as the nervous system calms, the mind always goes after it. So that's the process. It's simple, right? It sounds, because I think people, the reason that we wrote this book is to demystify it, meditation. Something I've been so passionate about for 20 years, and now I want people to do it. I want kids in schools to do it. I want adults to do it. I want the world to become a better place, and if I could get more people to do it, then I would lift the vibration of the planet just a little bit, and I'd really have contributed something beside, you know, entertainment, you know, uh, to really contribute to the happiness of the planet or to the planet's ability to get along with each other or love each other. And so that's why this book is so important to me. And I really have done a lot of work. Chris, you're watching me. You're kind of surprised, right? What am I surprised about? That I'm busting my ass. I'm everywhere. Oh, no, he's working for this. I've it's been true. Working. I mean, I give the money to charity for my books. I don't make any money on them. You know, and um, I've been working. The book's been on bestseller with us like seven weeks. I've been consistently working the book. And it's, it's going to conti continue. I want to put it in schools in Chicago where the most violence, you know, is I want people to watch the reduction in violence and see the, the school's vibrations change. I want to see that happen with people watching, not like the schools we have all over the country where it's going on, where the research is clear, but I want everybody to watch us do it in Chicago because I want to make it happen everywhere. And uh, that's just a big ambition. And so that's why I keep pushing. And, um, well, let's take it back a little bit. Um, for the people who haven't read the book yet, talk a little bit about, read the book. or yeah. for everyone who hasn't read the book yet, talk about your own journey to meditation. How, what led you there? Well, I went to yoga a little over 20 years ago because there was no guys there, just girls. <laughs> I 
fact that it was a full of, it was just full, all just beautiful girls. They didn't have Lululemon see-through, but no shit like this. Just, just shorts, you know. And I went to yoga, and I, there was a gay guy or two there, but no guys, you know. So anyway, I went to class, and I came out, I was high as hell. Like, oh shit. If I keep doing this, I'm not going to make any more money, because a little bit of freedom. And I used to think that the neurotic kind of person that I was, the noise that was always in my head, the rethinking and rethinking and the insomnia and the things that I was afflicted, that those things were part of this, the formula for success. Right. That working, overworking, overthinking was part of the process. And so when I came out, I was a little bit, you know, a little worried because for a moment there's a little freedom from that. And, and I learned since then that, that the seconds of stillness are the only time you ever can make an informed decision, be creative, or ever, never, happy in the future or the past. So the fluctuations of the mind are the cause of suffering and sadness, and the stillness of the mind is the cause of happiness. It's, it's, you know, every prophet has said it in every language you know, and promoted it throughout every, you know, all religious dialogue always, but we never, we have not embraced it. And now all the doctors are saying it, and, here's the, and they have all this proof, and so we should embrace this. This idea of quieting the mind, consciously working to quiet the mind. Everything that we do really is geared towards this. Everything we do. Take drugs, dumb the mind down, get the noise out. Uh, so it's cloudiness or clarity, the two choices. But haven't you all, always been looking for that even before you understood what meditation was? Before I was? took drugs? Well, yeah, because I remember, you know, there's a famous story I that Rick Rubin tells. very early. Yeah, but from that era. I took drugs really early. Before that, I didn't think about it much. Nah, he Did I misunderstand the question? I didn't even get the question out, but I mean, what I'm saying is... <laughs> He tells a story about, this is probably like early 85 when he was living, or mid 80s, whatever, living in NYU dorm room. Oh, you're going to pass the steam room story? Yeah, the steam room story. But we all, I mean, everything. You guys know the steam room story? No, you don't give a fuck. Everything is geared towards quieting the mind. Right. We don't realize it. We we make the mind go crazy while trying to quiet the mind. We want the mind to be still because that sunset, we're basketball players, we want to be in the zone. You want to see the ball come and catch it with this hand, put it around here, hand it to your man so he can dunk the ball. Right? That's what we want to do. I mean, we want, right? Ball players. And we want to see it coming. When the mind is fluctuating, you can't even catch the motherfucker. But when the mind is still, the rim is as big as this room. You can't miss. That expansive mindset is what we're all looking for. In the car accident, everything's moving slow. Because you've carved out the past, the future, everything. Oh, shit. <laughs> That's the way the world is really moving all the time. That slow. It's the fluctuation of your mind that's keeping you from seeing all the miracles as they unfold. The beautiful, all the stuff given to you, all this beauty, you don't see any of it because you got the noise in the mind. So we want to quiet the mind. And when we quiet the mind, we see it all. You've read this stuff because you're, you're all smart people. You've read. It's true. And, you know, having faith in it gives us, you know, more opportunity to move towards it. That means you have the tools available to you. You have meditation. You have, you know, do good karmic work, all this shit. All this stuff goes together, but the meditation is of the, all the tools, of all the eight parts of yoga, of all the religious teachings, of all the things that are meant to quiet the mind, to give you this consciousness, this heaven on earth. No tool is greater than quiet time. Because in here is where all, it all is. All right, so, but there are a lot of different types of meditation. What's, now, the type that we talk about in the book is mantra-based meditation. Yes. What brought you specifically to that style or that approach? Or did you try other ones first? How did you settle on I think I've tried a lot since. But I mean, I started out, my first teachers taught me to let go. It's good. Right. It's a good mantra. It's a mantra-based meditation. And then they taught me candle gazing. That's good. Right. They taught me um, 
you know, concentrating on a, a thing, a thing that won't move. You ever been to water in a pool, you're just chilling, right? You want the water just to fucking just. <laughs> and you're just chilling, that's meditation, you know, you just feel the fluctuate. So concentration is a good, fo- a good tool for meditation. Single pointed focus. Read a book and you forget to breathe. That's still. You know, so constant, you know. And so when you have, that's why when you like, you do your work. You make music. My God, you make music. And in between one snare drum and the other is a lifetime. The melody is beautiful, sucks you all the way in. So we want to be fully engaged in life, fully engaged in its beauty. And meditation is the greatest tool that I'm aware of. This is why I want to give the world this tool. Let's talk a little bit about uh, what trips the people up who do try it and feel like they weren't doing it right. Because I know that when you first started talking to me about meditation, you know, I'd be over at your house and you'd be like, let's meditate for 20 minutes. And I would sit there and I'd go through the motions. I'd have my eyes closed and I'd have the right posture. But in my mind, I kept thinking, this isn't working. I'm faking this. It isn't happening. And the reason... People expect shit. You well, that's, that's the question. I'm going to answer it. Okay. I know you. We want, okay. we want to. I'm for everybody else's benefit. Well, yeah. ask the question. For me, I've been working with this guy a lot of years. Right. Go ahead. This, this is a pro- yeah. So I kept thinking, my mind isn't turning off. I'm still having thoughts. I'm thinking about the fact that I'm not meditating. I'm thinking about the fact you know that I'm in this. You know, I'm going to include that in my answer, right? Okay. So the question is for someone who feels like their mind just can't turn off, why is that something that they shouldn't let trip them up? And, and do you even ever get past that? Or is that just part of the process? Like I said, the mind's like a monkey bouncing around the cage. You have seconds of stillness, and maybe not. But calming the nervous system and rebooting the mind, just like working out, you do a push-up, you might not get a muscle right. after one push-up. Right. But it's good that you did it kind of feel open your chest. You feel like a muscle man. You do two, you know, 10 push-ups, oh, shit. And the guy looking at you like, the same motherfucker. He's like, you haven't changed a bit, you know? But you feel, like you, you know, you feel. So it's how meditation is. You know, the mind needs to settle, needs to rest. In your sleep, your mind's going crazy. Your mind's doing all kinds of shit when you sleep, mostly. But when you meditate, it's calming some. Some days more than others. Every day, your meditation is different. Never the same, always infinitely different. But you have to sit and let your brain settle, let it rest, reboot. So people expecting something from meditation, it's not gonna work. Um, You will see results. If you meditate regularly, you will see dramatic results and changes in your relationship with the world, changes in the way that you eat food to be more mindful. The, the, the scanners will show more gray matter on the brain within six weeks of constant meditation. The left side of the brain, the right side of the brain will start to reconnect when it starts un- disconnecting at eight years old. It starts to reconnect. You want that, right? Um, your brain functionality will be improved. These are just, you don't have to look for that. That's just what's going to happen. So in the short term, Maybe just rest. The rest in perfection a little bit. The idea of operating from a calm space. We want, you know, the end result, right? Imagine just sit in a calm space, needing nothing. This idea of needing nothing. That's what meditation is. Okay, watching your thoughts come and go. In the world, being thoughtful in your choices, not worried about results, being present, awake, and thoughtful in your work focused. The work is the prayer. After all, there's no payment. They can't give you shit. In life, you want a comfortable seat. That's all you really want. If you can have a comfortable seat in life, then that is the goal. That's happiness. You're here to be happy. And from that comfortable seat, you operate from what they refer to as operating from abundance, right? So that's really purpose. And then from there, you become this great servant. Because when you take care of this, you become a good servant. And good givers are great getters, so the toys come, and the cycle of giving and getting speeds up, even though you slow down. 
And that, that's kind of the, the, you know, the rationale. It's why I always put success in the books, you know, like call my book Super Rich <laughs> before this. And everybody bought the book and said, how can I win? There's no. It's <laughs> the first chapter, State of Needing Nothing. You say, well, I'm going to throw this shit away. <laughs> but, you know, as you listen, you know, it's a prosperity book. State of Needing Nothing. Needing Nothing attracts everything. You know, when you go to work needing nothing and you just do your job, forget, you know, uh, results. It's really important. It's really, it's, it's a thing, you know, you get happy from doing the work. Making the song is the fun, the fun part. Listening to the song and making the song, that's the fun part. You know, you, if you're a record producer, you remember making the record, you don't remember the check. Get the car, you drive the car around the block, park the motherfucker and say, damn, $400,000 for nothing. Doesn't mean anything, the toys, the results. Um, we have to learn to move, you know, all of us have to let go of the needy thing because that is like this much happiness. It's so quick to come and go, it's nothing. But the state, you know, consistent bliss from a calm mind. And I know you know all of this. I'm repeating, there's nothing in my book new, there's nothing I would tell you that's new, but it's, it's, um, it's just remember to remember you know, why we're here and what our purpose and what makes us, you know, good servants. You know, so it, it's, it's, prosperity is a result. Let's bring it back to the success thing, though. Uh, <coughs> it always comes back to It that. always comes back to the success thing. You know, we're speaking at Google a lot of, like you said, smart, <laughs> ambitious people focused on their careers. So specifically for you as an entrepreneur, as a business person who's juggling, I can attest to, a lot of different things at one time, how has meditation helped you? How has it sharpened uh, you? I can say that I actually look every day. I meditate twice. That's forty minutes. I go to class. That's an hour and a half. Yoga class. A yoga every day. Right. Physical. I don't give a, what city I'm in. I find a hot yoga room or a nice vinyasa practice, and I go every single day. Um, so that's a lot of that's a lot of time out of my day. Um, I think I do twice as much in half the time. I think. Especially as a, a person who, you know, and, and all of us are, people have to make decisions, thoughtful, smart decisions. Get a little distance. And when you meditate, the first thing that happens is all the thoughts come racing into your mind. And, and you take inventory. And you see them for what they are as opposed to every thought giving you an emotional reaction. Now, you've talked about that's when some of your best business ideas have actually come to you is in yeah. that first initial stage of meditation. Yeah, because yeah. in, in the first part, in the first instance, there really is usually a lot of noise. Very seldom I sit down and say, ah, oh, I'm gone. <laughs> no, right. I sit and it's like, should I just, you know, the thoughts, I was going to say bad, but the thoughts come, you know, and, um, and, and you watch them differently. You watch them. And what you want to be in life is why we meditate, to be, we want to live in moving meditation. Want to be a meditative person. So in life, you want to be the watcher. The watcher is the greatest doer because the watcher is watch. Oh, let me just move this button. Everybody's like, oh shit, you see what he did? It's the watcher. And you know, the brain, you know, a little piece of your brain when you meditate. You know, anybody plays bad. I always think of the basketball thing because I've had it many times. You know, uh, and I'm not that good. In fact, I'm, about to I'm say, old. Yeah. I don't, I don't know why you were say, because you, I, anyway, but I'm much older now. I don't play basketball that often, and certainly not. I don't have like young guys putting their knee in my chest while they stuff the ball. That shit's not <laughs> happening anymore. But there, you know, there's the moments of you know, when you're really doing your thing because he keeps like shaking his head like, yeah, I'm nice, I'm nice. You're a basketball player, <laughs> so, but but you know, the idea of being awake, fully awake. You know, runners, you get there, everything moves slow. So, oh shit, I'm not even tired. I've been running for 300 miles. I'm not even ah, awake. You know, so why we don't know how to induce this state. We can't, as a, ba a basketball player, run out on the court and say, I'm going to get in the zone. I ain't going to miss shit. I'm going to shoot tw 12 points in two seconds like Reggie Miller in 1912. Wasn't it Reggie? You remember 90, that? 93. 93? Thank you. 93, 93. He, shot, all, he <laughs> shot everybody's eyes out. Why? Because he couldn't miss. It's impossible. So if you own the then Brooklyn Nets. The brain Nets. has that capacity. You're, you're, function out, you're, you're that when you're awake. If I what? I was saying, if you own the Brooklyn Nets, would you 
make meditation of part. Of course. Phil Jackson did that for his, for his Lakers, but of course. Right. I don't need anything. I want people to meditate. But do you, you don't, you I don't actually. I gave a teacher. She made her staff meditate. I gave Ellen a teacher. She made her staff meditate. Everybody I've given a good teacher and they learned to meditate, they gave it to their staff, you know, because it's important. And, and once you experience it, you want it to. That's why Rahm Emanuel's got to sit, never mind just giving him this idea. And the chancellor in Chicago have to sit. That way they can give it to all the kids. Should we get questions for these guys? They might need. Well, I thought before we opened it up to questions, maybe what would be helpful is to actually, all right, let's say someone sits here today, they listen to this, they grab the book, they read up, they decide they actually want to do it. Can we walk them through the actual steps of how to do it. I'm we're going to meditate at the end. I, we'll actually meditate at the end, but I want to like, or you want to, you want to take some questions now and then we'll meditate. Them. All right. They'll teach them when they meditate. So we'll take some questions. You're going to meditate with us for a minute. You got a few minutes to meditate at the end, right? You're not going to leave. Oh shit! Now I got to meditate. I got to go. <laughs> I mean, why do I sit here through the whole thing if I don't learn to meditate, right? She's like, let me out now. <laughs> <laughs> like watching paint dry, but I promise you, you're going to like it, right? All right. Let's get questions. I mean, like, no questions, right? Hi. Uh, thanks for speaking, first of all. Um, I just, you mentioned at the beginning uh, you wanted to bring meditation to schools in Chicago. Yeah. And I was curious if you had um, kind of what work you were doing there, if you were doing any at all. Um, very little. What plan you had. I, very little. I write blogs there. <laughs> no, about there. No, I've been, you know, I, I have peacekeeper programs in 25 cities that I work with people on and I have especially the three three in Queens you know because kids are so violent the communities are you know we don't talk about it. one hot weekend 60 kids could get shot in Chicago and you won't even read about them more kids got killed in a 20 block radius in Chicago than in the height of the Iraqi war you don't talk about it no one gives a shit so I want to go there and they do care there's, there's like the CNN did a special a series of specials there's, there's some discussion but there's no resolution. But quiet time is a part of a solution, or it might be even, even a greater solution than people can imagine. It certainly is in other cities where we've had success. And the David Lynch Foundation is doing. I'm going to do it with the David Lynch Foundation. Yeah. yeah. They are doing a lot in that regard. Lots of cities, lots of schools. Thank you. I'm on the board. I, we really do do a lot in schools. Um, thank you for being here. Um, I have a question. So how has your, like, let's say, approach to business and to life changed since you started meditating? You mentioned some things about, like, maybe you were partying before. But I'm more interested, like, in how your business decisions, how maybe you treat people, and in general, how what impact it had on you and your business. And I like to think that um, I'm a more compassionate person. I like to think I'm maybe easier to work for, but maybe not. You know, because I still, you know, I want people to be good at what they do. And I think the way that I motivate them is different from yelling. You know, I used to yell. Like, the fuck is wrong? Why? Did, you know, I don't ever do that anymore. I really don't have any experiences lately. I mean, I can think of that. I yelled at them. Well, fuck you then, bam. I used to do it all the time. And um, so I think that my relationship with my ex executives is different. And with my business associates is different. And I think I'm a lot more productive. I'm running a lot of stuff now. Three digital companies, fashion company, financial service company, music company. Um, there's more, five charities. I mean, four charities now, only four. So I'm, I'm running a lot of stuff now. And I feel like I can do more. Uh, and I also, I, I, I sleep at night. Sleep. I was an insomniac. And I sleep well. I do better. My personal relationships, I think, have improved. I think I'm much better. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I was just wondering um, if you've encountered this, and especially in rolling out uh, meditation to younger people. Well, sometimes when my experience is that when you talk to people about meditation or you're having a discussion about it, they they tend to have this almost cartoonish image of, you know, you're a swami on the Ganges in India, you know, and you're meditating. I'm a swami? No. <laughs> Personally, it's a swami. Maybe you are. I don't know. But uh, 
But um, I'm, I'm just wondering, particularly um, in terms of sort of rolling it out to young people who, you know, tend to <coughs> be more skeptical, I would think, of these kinds of things, you know, how you plan or how if you've had success in sort of overcoming this sort of knee-jerk reaction to it. Well, I've had lots of experiences where I got people who would not have meditated to meditate. From old, you know, Ellen DeGeneres, I'm on a show, I talked her into it. She got the meditation teacher. She joined the board. Oprah Winfrey, she was on a show. We talked about it. She took in a meditation teacher. She taught our staff. She's not only joined the board, she's the queen of Americans, uh, America's new con. This idea, you know, not necessarily religious, but the spiritual awakening that's happening in some parts of America with some people in America. Oprah is the queen of it. And opened up, you know, lots of people's minds about it. In the schools that we have in both, respectively, in Africa, the people sit in quiet time. So they help to spread the words. And lots of people, I mean, give them P. Puffy. P. Diddy? Meditator? <laughs> you know, so I taught him to meditate. You know. So yeah, people who would not meditate, um, a lot more of them are uh, meditating. But what um, about young people? That was the question. Like, have you found they're more? I could think of like, P. Diddy's a young person, so that no, makes right, me think know. I'm young. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it's no. You know, we go to, I go to schools and sometimes and work with principals and, you know, with people. Like, I've been to schools, like, where you know, lots of them, but I'm thinking in particular about uh, um, Dr. Rutherford's school in Washington, D.C., in the hood, where they were so the most violent. He just turned the school around, and the, the middle school and the, and the high school around dramatically through quiet time. You know, he's a Maharishi, he's a real transcendental meditation guy. He taught them all, they all have their own mantra. He did the work and the school is dramatic, shift in everything. The graduation rates, the, 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 I mean, the scholastic improvement is dramatic, the reduction in violence is dramatic, the, everything, complete turnaround. Um, I think I relate to kids a little better than some of the people. Um, I'm not ideal. It's not like I'm Drake, you know what I mean? But, I'm, <laughs> but I can talk to Drake. Like Drake can pick the phone up if I call him, <laughs> which is good. You know, I can get, you know, Rita Ora is like tweeting out. Justin Bieber sent me a tweet, said, Russ, Uncle Rush, teach me to meditate. Sent me a tweet. I was like, retweet that shit, retweet that. <laughs> we'll sell some books. Rita Ora, the it girl, my daughter is in love with this new singer, Rita Ora. Right? You guys don't know shit, right? In love with her. She tweeted out that she's really enjoying my book. It's a big deal, because my daughter's 14, and Rita Ora just told her she's enjoying my book on meditation. And then um, Chloe Kardashian tweeted out um, my Sunday afternoon. That I asked her to, but then she read it and called me and said I loved it. Because <laughs> she has, because she's got eight million Instagram followers. I don't know how many. She must have 20 million Twitter followers. And she tweeted, Instagram, and tweeted it out. That's how I made the bestseller, it's a good Chloe Kardashian. <laughs> so that kind of, you know, support system, changing young people's minds about it, that's the process, you know, and, and they need it. They're the ones with the anxiety. They're the ones who are you know, worried they're not good enough. Never mind that you know, half of you are like, oh my God, you wake up nervous, anxiety, over nothing. And meditation teaches us it's nothing, really, right? No. Um, you mentioned earlier that you know major thinkers and philosophers throughout time have um, you know said over and over in various different ways that stillness is the the link to happiness yeah. and and that you know every religion has said it in its own way and I was wondering in your experience if you had any religious background that either contributed to your involvement in meditation or how it might have played into it? Oh, I, I told you I think it was because of the chicks in class. <laughs> that was 20 years ago. I'm just kidding. I like to say because it's stupid. People laugh. <laughs> Not that stupid. But so. um, I, my brother's a preacher. He's a kind of a non-conventional, like, you know, preacher. And so he's a, and my father and mother are Christians, but, you know, they, uh, I fainted like I was like a 12 or something. I don't know what if I never fainted again the rest of my life. I fainted at the bus stop coming home from church. They never made me go again. Like, I don't know. I could have fa staged it, but I didn't. It just happened. And they, they came and got me and said, what happened? You fell out. Yeah, we were out for two seconds. We took you to the doctor. Right, okay. Mom picked me up from the doctor. That was it. I never had to go to church again. 
now I go to churches to speak about meditation, but or about you know spiritual matters. Because, but I you know I do read all of the propaganda associated with yoga, the Yoga Sutras, the Bhagavad Gita, the Hatha Yoga Padipika, the textbook of yoga psychology, you know all the Yoga Nanda stuff. I read all that propaganda, all that stuff. I like that because it's non-religious, you know, until you get to some of the you know the deity stuff and that you know relates to Hindu stuff. But before that, the Yoga Sutras is only a science book for happiness. It's the core, 6,000 years ago, this Yoga Sutras, you read it, it's like so relevant. It's like 194 threads, a sutra is a thread. So the Yoga Sutras, and yoga is, the, yo the second sutra is Yoga Shita Friti Narodaha, means in Sanskrit, it means yoga is the cessation and the fluctuation of the mind. Or God consciousness comes when the mind is still. And that, that's beautiful, that's it. I mean, that's, you know, the rest of this shit, you know, you know I, we all know, we, you know, you came out of the ocean and you grew a lung and then you stood up. Right? You know that, right? It was Adam and Eve shit is hard to digest, right? So you know that you came out of the ocean, you grew a lung. We believe that, some of us, right? And, and, and I like what, what Krishna said and what yogis have said about union. God with the ocean, we'd be a cup of God. Why do I believe that now? Because quantum physicists are starting to believe it too. Right? That we're all connected. All the animals we abuse, all the planet we fuck up, all the shit we weird, that's us we fucking with. Us. We're all connected. So that's a religious kind of idea. I mean, it's a spiritual, but you know, in the basis of a lot of what the prophet said too, although it's not what we teach, it's separation through, I'm not knocking religion, but it's kind of separate in cases. And, you got to double check what they tell you, right? The imams, rabbis, you know, preachers, they might say some shit, might put some people in the oven, they do anything. They do horrible stuff, religious leaders. So I kind of shy away from all, even though I'm the chairman of the Foundation for Ethnic Understanding, and I have imams and rabbis uh, in 40 countries having dialogue, exchanging pulpits and working together. Including in Israel, we have 20 programs, so it's a real, you know, I really believe in religion as a way of helping people, but I don't personally subscribe to any. Well, how about this, though? I had an incident, and this kind of ties into your question, on Easter Sunday where my aunt, who's a born-again Christian and very serious about that, came up to me and took me aside and said she'd read the book, and I could tell she was a little nervous, and she was concerned that meditation would interfere with or kind of... Thinking for yourself is a problem. Well, hey, but like it would, anti-prayer, I think was the term she used, or would somehow affect her prayer. That's you? <laughs> that cream? That's cream. All right. I think it's kind of a, you like that, Wu-Tang Clan? <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I, you know they, they, the Buddha said, check for yourself, right? Check for yourself. Double check what they tell you. Turn this thing off. I just wanted to stop ringing. I don't know if that answered your question. But. <laughs> I think I did, right? Yeah. Um, I answered the question or no? Absolutely. Wait, you asked me about religion. I don't personally give a fuck. <laughs> but I believe it's good for people. And I don't, it doesn't really, you know, I have not found a religion that suits me. Compassion, so religiously practice compassion. And the Buddhist guy here on the bottom, the Om, though. The Om is really. And they just put him here. He don't get in too many fights. <laughs> I like him because he has the least fights. It's <laughs> true. Um, I'm going to take a question so no yogis at war. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So my name is Keith. It's uh, great to have you here. Really appreciate your time. Um, so I got a pretty simple question. You know, I moved to Manhattan about a year ago from San Francisco, and I feel like anytime you move to the city, you just have this tendency to want to, like, triple your workload, right? Manhattan is just moving so quick. And so I did that and realized that I was just kind of going stir crazy and I needed to sit down and, you know, meditate for the first time. So I try to work it into my daily routine. And so, um, you know, I was trying to do it 10 minutes every morning before I walked to work. I remember the first three times I did it, like I thought I was crazy, you know, listening to all the thoughts in my head. I mean, there was just so much going on. I've never done this before. Uh, but eventually, you know, I kind of gave it up because <laughs> I was trying to do everything else. You if know? you don't have 20 minutes, you need two hours. 
Yeah, I mean, it was it was tough. Did you hear it me? It was really tough. You need, so my question if you don't hear, if you don't have 20 minutes, you need two hours. Yeah. The thoughts should bounce around, they should have fun, and they should settle. And they will settle for everyone. No one is exempt. Everyone will meditate if they sit. Mm -hmm. And patience. Don't look for anything. Don't expect anything. I promise you. You know, it, it's like you, it, there's no way you can't meditate. And if you have more work, I always say, they say, oh, Russell, your schedule, like the assistant's traveling with me, we're going somewhere. So you, you get up at 6 a.m., you go to do these eight radio stations, then you do this TV, then you have the event, and after the event, then you have to go to, you know, meet with this person, and you have this meeting, and then you have that event. And then you have your, four, you know, your yoga at 4, 445 <laughs> to 545. It's only an hour class? Yeah, it's an hour. Okay. Then from five, 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 6 o'clock on, you're going to just be doing interviews. Do I have my meditation and my yoga class? With that, it's the rest of it's a game. I do what I'm told. The idea of the sickness that comes from the anxiety that comes from the schedule, I don't know where I'm going next. Let's go where they fucking tell me. I mean, I like, if I have to be prepared, they prepare me. I just go, I do what I'm told. You don't have to have anxiety over your work. Your work is a fun challenge. Work has to be fun. I don't, I don't look forward to seeing the accountant for an hour, but he's on the schedule. <laughs> got to see his ass and listen to him talk. And, you know, I got to do it, but it's okay. I don't have to get anxiety over it. Going to the studio to watch some, I, that should be fun. I do have preferences. I'd like not to have any. I'd like to be blissful in all things and even keel. But to some degree, I'm not, you know. But more often than I used to be, I am. This is why we meditate so that we can have an even keel, happy disposition. And by doubling your workload, that should be exciting. You know, as long as you take your time, go to the gym, whatever you do, what do you do for yourself? Like, work out? Well, outside of, yeah, I work out a little bit. But you work out like, uh, <laughs> Like that, I mean, I, I play some basketball as well. And so you get in the zone? What's that? How, how dope I, is it I, when you like, high as hell, I, right? Much like, when you get real high, like I mean, you when I came out here to Manhattan, I was playing on the the uh, the courts on the. Uh, no more time for that now, huh? No time. I I mean, it's hard juggling all this stuff, you know. And you got to make time to play basketball. Like, where you find the time? Do you play violently? The elbow <laughs> I, people? I, I are you mean? To, it depends, you know. If I get an elbow in the rib, then you get an elbow in the rib. You say, oh shit, this motherfucker did that. It makes you a little mad. But you cannot. You have to be happy in your work. And you have to take care of the Mulandara chakra, first chakra first. Take care of yourself. Meditate, do some workout. Work out your brain, reboot your brain, and, and promote circulation in the body. But that, beyond that, there's nothing else. Green juice. Well, don't eat animals. Right. You eat animals? <laughs> do you eat, wait, you yeah, eat dairy I, and I, egg and fish yeah, and shit I, like that? I eat steak, chicken, you know, duck. <laughs> I just ate some duck last night. You eat steak? You eat steak? I'm some animals. Did you guys yeah. know the new steak shit? Did you hear? <laughs> you heard? That if you eat steak, it's 30% of your protein, and that's what you do regularly, it's equal to 20 cigarettes a day. I know the first day I started promoting my book, it was seven weeks ago, I went to Dr. Sanjay, and I went to a few others, and I went to Fox and fucking Friends. <laughs> and Fox and Friends... Fox and Friends, they were discussing this new research. They wouldn't say it if it wasn't true. Not them. <laughs> 20 cigarettes. This is how much cancer you're putting in. 20 cigarettes a day? I, I firmly believe that the, the worst karmic disaster in the history of the world is the abuse of 40 billion animals, born, made to be born, into suffering. They fought, greatest cause of global warming, times twice all the planes, trains, and automobiles. Then they give you cancer. They take all the oil, the water, the grain, everything. They make you sick. This is why we meditate, so we can choose whether we want to participate in that karmic disaster or not. We don't want to be sheep. We want to check, in our, check our temperature. What do we think about the abuse of animals? Dominion over the animals. How, the fuck, how can you say dominion over the animals and then do that? So hurtful. So that's why we have to meditate because society, sometimes we go on the wrong course. 
Whole societies, whole communities just say, oh, let's, you know, let's genocide or let's, you know, we don't like their religion, let's kill them. Put them in an oven, let's do it. It's horrible, horrible stuff. So you have to decide for yourself what you want to participate in. And that's why we meditate also, because then when you have the thought settle, you say, no, I don't want to do that shit. They can have that, right. you know, or maybe I'll speak up against it. Maybe I'll have a voice, use my voice. So not to take up too much time, but my question. I, I don't even answer your question. It's went on a how, tangent. I don't, how do you find time for this? I mean, you're a super busy guy. You say that it's on your calendar, but I it's feel like calendar. it's something you need to do every single day. So it's every day is different. I have a lot of businesses. It's true. And I have a lot of smart people. Everybody around me is smarter than me. Everybody. So that's key. I think in my position, you need smart people. Unless you're smart. Especially smart, I mean, like really. <laughs> All right, thank you. <laughs> I think she was the first. Okay. okay. Hi, my name is Andrea. Thank you What's for coming. Name? Andrea. Hi, Andrea. Hi. Um, I was just interested more in this idea of. Do you have like, a diamond in your eye? Yeah, no, it's an eye rare ring. <laughs> <laughs> Um, in this idea of religion and kind of dealing with people who may be resistant to meditation um, or yoga, and I'm interested in how would you persuade someone who may not be day, interested yeah. for perhaps a, a religious reason? For example, um, I teach yoga, and I have a sister who is very religious. You teach yoga? I do. Um, and similar to the story you mentioned earlier, you know, she's very resistant. I think she would be someone who could benefit, um, you know, from meditation. But I don't really know how to approach her because I know that her views are really influence the way that she thinks. So what would you say to someone like that? Well, first of all, um, be still and know is in her scripture, right? It's quiet. They don't have to, there's no deities in silence. It's just being quiet. You know, you can give her a vibration or you can just tell her to sit and say let, inhale let, exhale go. Let go. It's not, it's not against your religion. She has a piece of God inside you. Maybe you can dig deeper. Don't say it if it scares her, but, maybe she, but the idea that there's a piece of God inside you and if you sit get closer to it, God, should it strengthen your faith? It should, could strengthen your faith. And regarding the, the yoga, you know, a lot of the Christian yogis and Muslim yogis and other religious yogis, or yogis who have faith already separate from what's in the Bhagavad Gita, you know, the, the deities are scary, right? Shiva, Krishna, you know, Lakshmi, all this rap. This, wait, who are these people? But they're just images of ideas, you know, the people, the goddess of wealth. You give and get, cycle of giving, you know. They, so they said, just, just there for that. But you can leave them out. You, you don't have to use Sanskrit words, right? Upward dog, you don't have to call it, you know, right? So I think it's easy, though. Know, yoga, we're just stretching to promote circulation. And meditation, we're just being quiet to reboot our brain. We don't have to scare them, we don't, and we don't need to. And I'm having this discussion with lots of people about, because we have what we call quiet time in schools. We don't even use the word meditation. Right. Quiet time. And I think that that's a, it's all it is. In the, in the end, that's what it is. That's what the research is on, the quiet time, not on Krishna. You know, it's true. You probably have studied all the scripture, right, as a yoga teacher? All right, thank you. Thank you. Go on this side. Um, my Okay. She's next. <laughs> thanks. Hi, I'm Mei Mei, and thanks for coming. Um, so I feel like a common thing that I, when I try to talk about meditation, the common pushback that I get, which I'm not sure I have a good defense for, is that what if meditation makes you too complacent in a world where there might not be room? Like, sometimes I feel like for me it's like, for example, well, this is not meditation related, but kind of an analogy. Like in high school, I wasn't a very good basketball player because I'm like, well, you take the ball this time, I'll take the ball next time. Like, <laughs> whatever happens, happens. <laughs> or, um, or like in work, for example, or in a, in a relationship or whatever, if you're like, okay, is this just me not liking it or is this me not getting along with the person? Or is it just a mindset that I need to shift? Or if you lose something. So, I guess my question is, how do you not become too much of, okay, well, this is just a part of life, and these emotions that I feel 
are just an instantaneous emotion that will pass by if I let it go. I think uh, by being quiet, you get in touch with a strength, not a weakness. I think that's the point, you know, it's like, you sit, I don't know what, they're chopping up animals. Let me go protest. A lot of meditators, you find they're activists, right? They're not quiet, they're activists. More likely to be activists, to go outside the box, to do what's in their heart. Um, if they're basketball players, they're more clear. If they go to work every day and they're focused and present in the moment, they do a good job. The work is a, not a, it's a challenge that we accept. The relationship is a challenge. We accept it, we're present, do our best. You gotta get the fuck out. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, you tell them, you know, you say whatever, you, you can be strong, you can say no, it's not gonna work. Not mean, but you can be strong. Meditation helps you to find the strength. Doesn't make you complacent. That's a misconception. And I can say that, you know, in all certainty, you feel more in charge, more confident more awake. And so it's not about being complacent at all. In fact, it's the opposite. And that's just my argument. I and mean, if you can tell me an example of how you've been a meditator and it made you a doormat, or it made you less likely to fulfill your dharma, then I can you know, speak to it. But I don't think you have those examples. If you meditate, you would take more control of your life. You're not going to let go of it. My question is related to uh, hers, I guess. Uh, my name is Aditya. And I grew, while growing up in India, I remember my uh, grandparents used to have the similar things, what you have in your hand, like beads and the, with the om and all. And we used to collect in the evening to do meditation. They just call it quiet time because meditation wasn't hip with kids. Uh, <laughs> That's the experience. So, but the, kind of along the way, um, come here. At that time, I, we kind of, at that time, we thought we were wasting about almost a half an hour to an hour. <laughs> <laughs> that what you thought as a child? Because everybody was studying hard, and I didn't study that much. But I used to recall more. I used to remember more. So and everybody was like surprised. Why was I? How do you remember things like that? I was taught like in, almost six months ago. I have no idea. So, but now I'm, I'm like, um, uh, in, I kind of lost all that because like grandparents are gone uh, since then. And, Stop making uh, you meditate. Yeah, nobody is making me meditate. Yeah, my kids, I, don't, I think the minute they get from under my foot, I mean, Kimora's <laughs> foot on their throat, then they're going to stop meditating. Yeah, and They meditate every day and they're deep meditators. But I think that they, oh, daddy, and their mother's like, get in there. And they sit, and they, but in the minutes, say half an hour you wasted, do you know how long it is? You sit there and everything's going crazy. The next thing you know, it's like meditation's over. Or the next thing you know, it's you enjoy it. But kids will still resist if you make them. I make my kids, but I know it's, they both go to school for the gifted. My 11 year old has been meditating since she's eight. My 14 year old since she's 10. I've been meditating a long time. So, and they meditate, they're deep meditators. They just disappear quickly. I don't want to do it. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> like as I look over them, you know, you know, cause sometimes they could be fidgeting or they could be like, you know, you know, daddy, we're resisting, you know. I'll tell your mama, and they just go back to, but then they disappear. Then they open their eyes, you can just see, and they're so happy, and they start giggling and laughing and happy. And before meditation, they could have just been, mama, I don't want to, and then they open their eyes like, happy. And so, I don't know, you know, you force goodness on people, and say, don't eat that, don't eat that, don't eat that, then one day they're just gonna eat a lot of it. So, that could be true, but you, Having had that experience and having a greater memory and greater brain functionality and, and a more expansive mindset and all that, you, you don't miss that. You work at Google, you don't need your brains. <laughs> Go back, meditate. Yeah, so I actually, Get quiet time. Yeah, in quiet time, that's what I was thinking about. But on my subway, that's kind of an hour long commute to home, then my son needs my attention. Then, so adding on to uh, his question, I think earlier, uh, whether is it okay to like, I was thinking like, why not the subway has uh, screens where they just 
people say the meditate or yoga, and then we all in some way would start doing that because everybody is <laughs> standing anyway, just close their eyes, and then uh, you would know when the stop has come because it announces now, right? So I mean, <laughs> have you have you thought about like put it putting it because I can do that in office, I can do that in home, right? Because I can't make my two year olds say sit with me. <laughs> so like on some way, or like some, always a place to meditate. Go to the bathroom. <laughs> Sit on the toilet, put uh, an on. I, medit I meditate in my bathroom. I put a pillow on the toilet. That's the only place I can get away. Why are you looking at me like that? That's the only. <laughs> on the toilet go. seat? I mean, with a pillow? I shut it. Yeah. I oh, shut you shut it. it. I shut <laughs> it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I meditate on the subway too. I mean, you got to. It's New York. You got to get in. You get your alarm. You put the alarm on. You sit. Yeah. And you sit, and, you, and no matter what, you, that's the the best thing is the alarm for beginners. You turn the alarm on. A little sunshine ring or whatever. It's the ring you put on there. Who's that? You waving? We have to My leave? Friend. No. Who's that? Saying hi. Oh, oh, hi. We should do one more question and then but we should But though the idea of you put the alarm on your sit. And is chanting also a form of meditation? Can chanting is another form of meditation. Of course, it, you know, that's, you know, it's another. Anything that quiets the mind. People chant themselves into bliss. Um, you know, kirtan. Yogis they chant, chant. I've never been a big chanter. I chant when they tell me. I do what they say. It doesn't. You know, oh, okay, I do it every class. And I, you know, and they, they'll chant a few words, lokas, namastas, like, you know, Hindu prayers, and they're okay, and people do it, but people really, just like some people candle gaze. They look at a candle, they just stare at the fucking candle, they stare. They just out, staring at a candle. You know, I've done it, it didn't, didn't really grab me as, as my form of meditation. But, you know, it, it, I'm sure I, I could learn to, to candle gaze or chant more and any of those things, um, they all work. So I have a friend who's like gone in these meditation retreats where you like kind of leave for 10 days and you're silent and they have these people that help you go through this course of like 10 days you don't speak and you like meditate. Yeah. Are there any benefits you, you see to like just really removing yourself from an extended for an extended period versus like the daily, like what are the, have you done it? I know again? all about it. What do you think? Um, I've heard about it from countless people who had great experiences. No one's ever come back from a ten day silent retreat and said that sucked. No one. <laughs> no, really, no one's ever told me that. They always say, oh, I went away, and after a couple of days, I was like, I was fucking gone, man. I was high, I didn't know where, you know, been, and I came back and oh, I was so relieved. Everybody. Same, same response. And I, you know, I, I haven't taken 10 days to do it, but I get it. Um, I'm sure there's benefits, you know, and that's why people do it. And, and they get high and happy, and it's good for them. I probably should do it. I haven't. Okay. <clears throat> now, if you want to get out now, you can. <laughs> so you want to adjust, let's, let's set it up a little bit. Well, I'm going to make it short. Seven we have minutes. time to do like a... You got seven minutes? Seven minutes is a long time. Seven minutes? You guys can handle seven, seven minutes? minutes. I, I, first of all, your first experience, you sit home, you do what I tell you, you sit for 20 minutes <coughs> by yourself. So now we're all together. We sit for seven minutes. It's not hard. You going to set your phone? Yeah. All right. But let's... I don't see why you would say seven minutes is a long time. Chris, do you keep up on your meditation? I you write a at, book with me. Yeah, but, I was up at six o'clock this morning doing it. All right. Well, why do you think they can't... You think they can't... Look, she's up. Let me out of here now. <laughs> Okay, look, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to give you a mantra, rum. That's the mass, the collective is going to use rum. We're all going to use rum, rum. Say rum, 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 rum. Say it really fast. Rum, 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 rum. Now say it slow. Rum. So that's our mantra, rum. Doesn't have any meaning, so don't think. It's not alcohol. Not alcohol, it's just rum. It's rum. It's a vibration. It has no meaning, but we're going to concentrate on this word. But we're not going to concentrate hard on the word. We're going to concentrate lightly on the word. Try to keep it in our sense, in, the, in front of us. And we're going to try to focus on rum. And then the mind's going to go crazy. It's going to go into... First thing, we're going we're to do a few tricks before we start, but that's going to be our mantra. And, but the mind is going to go somewhere into a thought. You're going to think the thought if you want. If it's not worth it, don't think it. If think it, think the thought. Understand the thought, digest the thought, and go back to your mantra. Let's go back to your mantra. Keep coming back gently to the mantra. Hold the mantra. 
it should become at some point the mantra will be so much more satisfying than the thoughts that may not happen today. Nothing may not happen today. But if you are not looking for anything, you will definitely find great peace even today. You sit, you repeat the mantra to yourself, and that's it. Now, first thing we're going to do a little breathing exercise. Two fingers. Right? Breathe in through your left side. Hold it. Breathe out through your right side. Let's do that 20 times. Go on the right side now. Hold it. Focus on the space between the breath. When you hold it, Hold it. Release. Now, do me a quick favor before we begin. Close your eyes and think of everything at one time. Now you're all meditating because no one had a thought, <laughs> right? Oh, everything at once and no thought. So we're going to sit. Open your eyes. Sit. We're going to sit down. Maybe relax in the most comfortable position that we can find. We're going to start to repeat our mantra to ourselves. Not going to expect anything. Not going to regulate our breath. Just going to repeat the mantra and rest in perfection for a few minutes.
come out of it, begin to come out of it. Breathe deep. Smile. How was that? Yeah? All right. Wouldn't cost shit. It's free. <laughs> Do it every day. So, thank you so much. It's a pleasure.